morning to all those that are joining us online. Um, it's exciting to know that what we say has great impact on people that maybe we'll never meet. That's, that's exciting to me, that God can just lay something in our heart and we can speak it here in little Inverness, Florida, that most people don't even know where in the world that is, but yet someone on the other side of the world or the other side of the country could hear whatever the word is, and, and God, God can touch that heart and move that life in just tremendous ways. So I think it's so exciting, and, I, and I'm so thankful for everyone that will take the time to listen, because this is a good word that comes from this fellowship. Whoever is up here, they're bringing a good word. You never have to be afraid about what you're getting here at New Covenant Grace. It's a good word. It's a freedom word. It's a grace word. And so the name of my, if I was going to put a title on this, and I'm always asked for titles, I, I thought, well, finding joy in tribulation is going to be the, the somewhat title, and maybe you will agree with me when we get all done. So obviously, uh, what we're going to talk about, Jesus said, at one point in, in John, in this world you will have tribulation, right? And so he, it was just a matter of fact. And, and in this world, I think most of us, if not all of us, have experienced tribulation. And definition is so important. Tribulation is different than trouble, right? Uh, on the Wednesday night we talked about, well, what is tribulation to you, you know? And some said one thing and another thing. Trouble, trouble to me are situations that are, are relatively small, more of an inconvenience to us than anything. Like my dryer is, is starting to uh, act up and I'm thinking, oh, I've got some trouble coming in the tune of either repair or replace. And so that's trouble for me. If you were in a hurry to dash off to an appointment and you jump in your car and find your battery dead, that would be trouble to you, you know? It's inconvenient, it's short in duration, but tribulation, and I was thinking about this, what, is, what would you call tribulation? And to me, tribulation is when an event overwhelms and overtakes your life to the extent that you are powerless to do anything about it. Is that a fair assessment? And I think, you know, like here in Florida, we have these thunderstorms that roll in and roll out, and we have thunder, we have lightning, we have rain, we might lose the power a little bit, your, your internet might flicker or whatever, and, um, but in a little bit, it's done and over with. You know, you're back to life as usual. But then, down here in Florida, we have the hurricane season, don't we? And I tell you what, you just have to live through one of those hurricanes to know that that storm is tremendous in power and in strength and devastation, and you can't do anything to stop it. You can get out of its way, but you cannot stop it. And so to me, tribulation is a situation that all of a sudden it has overtaken your life, and you have no power to control it, to stop it, and you somehow have to try to survive it. And so we're going to look at this, but in, in the very beginning, I want, to, I want to look at 2 Corinthians 7, verse 4, and I want to look at King James. If uh, you would pull that up, Chris, 2 Corinthians 7, verse 4, and I'm taking this kind of out of context because I just want to speak the heart of Paul on this. If we can get it, can we get it? Aha. It says... Paul is saying, he's talking to his, his followers, great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. And I thought, really? Have you ever put the feeling of exceeding, being exceedingly joyful in tribulation? To me, it's, it's kind of like night and day. They, they, they really don't go together. But yet I am finding that there is scripture to substantiate that we're supposed to. There is, there is the way to experience great joy in tribulation. Now, I am not saying that we should be joyful because we have the tribulation. That is not what I'm saying here. The joy 
is not for the tribulation, it's the joy in spite of the tribulation that we're going to look at this morning. So I want to look and find this path to joy. And I'm going to begin, the text that we're going to look at is going to be Romans chapter 5. And I'm going to do New Living Translation. I'm going to jump into King James a little bit, just because the wording, I think, is a little clearer, and I like it a little bit better. So, Romans chapter 5. Let's look at the first two verses. Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand, and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. The second verse is so important to us. You know, when you start reading scripture, it's so important to get the context, get the whole meaning of, of the verses around it, because you can go on and read some of these. We're going to go on and, and look at some of these tribulation scriptures and stuff, and it's, it kind of gets you off balance. Paul, in his wisdom, was setting the groundwork. He was saying, before I get to tribulation, before I get to what I want to talk to you about to help you, I want to set the groundwork so your mind is in the right frame, that you're looking in the right direction, you have the right understanding. And he said, first of all, because we have been made right with Christ, because of Jesus Christ, that we, in verse 2, it says, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege. We didn't deserve it, but yet we are here. And what is this place of privilege? For all of us grace folks, this place of privilege is that we are now one with Christ. We are children of God. We are inherited. We, are in, we have inherited the kingdom of God on this earth. Am I right? We have all that heaven has to offer is now ours. We don't deserve it, but we have it. We have it because of Christ. Because we chose to believe that Christ died for us, we have this in us. And now, we just don't know it, but we stand and we... This is the place where we stand. We stand in that knowledge. We stand in the experience of being kingdom people. And we are confident and joyful because we look forward to sharing God's glory. That means all that Christ has is coming to us. So this is a really healthy, and you need that mindset, you need to understand that perspective, and you need to have this in focus as suddenly the tribulation comes upon your life. So let's go on and look at Romans 5, verse 3. I want to look at this in the King James because it reads just a little bit better. We can switch it over. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. There again, it's talking about glorying, being happy in tribulation. Why in the world would we be happy in tribulation? Because this tribulation works patience for us. Now, if you're like me, I've heard and I've been raised in the church a lot of years. And people would come to me and they would want prayer. And so many, so many of them were young moms and they would, they would say, I'm so frustrated with my kids that they are just driving me crazy. I need you to pray for patience, but I don't really want to pray for patience because I know the scripture says that the only way I'm going to get patience is by going through tribulation. And so they were serious. They were afraid because who wants tribulation? And they were always taught to look at this verses of scripture. I don't know about you, but I was taught Romans chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. That was my, my little goal, that if I'm a good Christian, if I ever want to attain my spiritual badge, I'm going to be a person of patience. And it goes on to talk about endurance and character. Wow, that was heavy. And all the focus was on me. You know, I've got to 
this tribulation, this tribu and the thought was, this tribulation that God has given to you is to whip you into shape because obviously you have no patience. Obviously you need endurance. Obviously your character is really shabby and you need this. Well, I'm sorry to tell you that none of that is correct. Well, I'm not sorry to tell you, I'm happy to tell you. None of that is correct. Because of why? Why? Because we just read verses 1 and 2. Didn't we just read this? And didn't we just say that, golly, because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand and we, are com we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. That this is not about us trying to attain, that we are confident of the place that we are standing. We are standing in the acceptance of God. We are standing as the beloved of God. We are standing in holiness and righteousness. We are blessed. We have favor. We are forever in the kingdom. It will never be taken away from you. Because of why? Because of Christ. So this tribulation is not sent from our Father trying to reprimand you, to judge you, to uh, inflict pain in your life. This is not God. And sometimes when we're in tribulation, we say, God, why don't you do something? Why don't you do something? And all the while, we have to come to understand, and we're going to see this morning that God is doing something. He is doing something. He didn't give this tribulation because he said, you know, in this world, guess what, guys? It happens to everybody. It's not just to the church. It's not just to us believers. It's not just to the grace people. In this world, everybody, everybody is going through tribulation. Just look outside the window today. Everybody is in some sort of a fix, and they're wanting to find some answers. And when you are in tribulation, when you've got a situation that is beyond your control, who is, who is standing right next to you, talking at you? The good old spirit of fear. That fear will come in and start telling you how bad it is, how worthless you are, your inability to ever survive this situation. This is the end of you for sure, because God is not happy with you. And on and on and on and on and on the litany goes. And we have spoken so many times here, we have to stand against fear fear, don't we? We are no longer slaves to fear. Christ, we sang it this morning. I tell you, these songs that we sing just reconfirm all the messages that we preach here. You know, we are free. We need to live like we're loved. Live like you're free. We have to understand that we, through Christ, are now the victors. We are no longer the victims. And so we are free. We are free from this. You know, there was man... Saul, back in the Old Testament, he was under the Old Covenant. And let me show you the difference of living under Old and New Covenant. Saul, under, he was the king of Israel. And if you want to read this, this was found, I think, in 1 Samuel 13, I read this. Saul was told by Samuel to wait. Patience, basically, is what? Learning to wait. To not take control, not allow your natural thought process, your natural desire to kick in and do something. If you are a patient person, if you're this young mother with the little kids that are driving you crazy, and you've got the three-year-old that is adamant that he is big enough to put the coat on and get it zipped and get into the car, and you are looking at your watch and saying, we've got five minutes, okay, let's get the coat on, let's get it zipped, and this little booger, he is having a time, and he doesn't want you to help and you're getting frustrated, and you are impatient, and you're saying, come on. And then pretty soon, you just grab the kid, grab the coat, you zip it up, and you put him in the car, and you feel bad afterwards. Now, if you were a patient mom, you would just, OK, honey, we just, just put that in there and get a hold. We'll just wait. You can do it, you know? That's, that's patience, OK? Yeah, that's June Cleaver. We don't have it naturally, do we? The whole point of that, you'll only do that maybe once or twice, but when the, when the pressure is really on, you're going, to, you're going to grab onto that situation, and you're going to do whatever you think needs to be done. Patience 
is not an easy thing to do. And Saul was now the new king of Israel. And Saul was told by Samuel, because he was the voice of God back then. Saul could not hear God himself. So Samuel was the voice of God. And Samuel came to Saul and he said, Saul, because Saul and the army were fighting the Philistines. Now, if you remember your story right, the Philistines were the big bad giants of the land. When, when Israel first came into Canaan, they said, oh, there are giants in the land. They, we were grasshoppers in comparison. And so that fear was well established in the hearts of these people. And so here is Saul now trying to push back the Philistines from an area that God said, this is your land now, go and take it. And so, Samuel said, wait for me to come because we're going to offer a sacrifice to God and we're going to get God's counsel on what to do in this situation. And Saul's thinking, okay, you know. And meanwhile, Samuel doesn't come. He doesn't come and the situation gets worse. And now his men are, are totally consumed by fear. Half the army now is deserting him. And Saul is looking around and he is thinking, if I don't do something right now, Everything's going to be lost. I'm going to go ahead and do the silly sacrifice. I will hear from God, and we are going to just take a hold and win this battle because God has always been for us. And so he did. And so here comes Samuel, and Samuel says, Saul, why in the world didn't you wait? And so he explained in his fear what he did. And the story was they lost the battle but Saul lost his kingdom that day. Under the old covenant, there were strong repercussions for breaking the rules. And so many today, when you're under the intense warfare, the tribulation, if you will, and you don't have this patience to keep your hands off the situation, and you mess up, you mess up. If you have been under law, under old covenant, under old teaching, you're going to say, I'm, I'm all done. God's written me off. I've been discounted. I've lost my place in the kingdom. Heck, I don't even know if I'll make heaven now. And that is so not true. Why is it not true? Because we read verses 1 and 2 in Romans chapter 5. That says, we stand confident in our place in Christ. We stand confident. It's not by our ability to do all this right or to do not do all this other wrong stuff. It's learning to live in Christ. And this whole thing that God is saying to us, he is saying, wait for me, church. Wait for me, my beloved. I am there in that situation with you. You don't have to, even though the stress is on you, even though the fear is coming against you, if you can just resist that fear and see yourself free from it and know that I am with you in this and I will give you a strength and with this patience of not taking hold of the situation, therein is the victory. So it's not if you get upset with your kids or, or you, it's, it's not about us and our ability. It's waiting in the spirit for God until you hear God because God has the answer for your tribulation. He has the way out for you and he wants you to find it. This isn't 20 questions. God wants to show you. He's more than willing to show you the way. I love this one scripture that is found in Isaiah chapter 40, and it's verse 31. Everyone knows it, King James. But they that wait upon the Lord. So if you are waiting, if you can wait, if you can just keep your focus on Christ in this, this standing that we have in the kingdom and how we are really free and how we are really victorious, those that can wait upon the Lord shall do what? They're going to renew their strength. They're going to mount up with wings as eagles, and they're going to run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. As we wait upon the Lord, as you put your trust in God and say, Lord, 
I am trusting in you. And this is not going around with your eyes closed and your hands over your ears saying, la, 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 I can't see my problem, my problem, I don't see it anywhere. That is not what I'm saying. You are looking at this thing, this thing is consuming you, and you are not giving in to fear because you are saying, my God is faithful. I know in whom I have believed, and I am totally convinced that he is able to keep me even in this. Even in this, this situation is not going to overwhelm my life. This situation is not the ruin of my life. This situation is going to end, and I am the victorious one because I stand in confidence of knowing it is in Christ that I stand, and I am confident in his victory. I am not confident in my ability. I am not confident in my victory. I stand confident in Christ, my victorious one and he will renew my strength. So when you're in this situation, and I think there are so many of us that are in this situation that we say, my God, I can't go on another minute. I can't stand it another second. I have got to do something. I've got to react to this situation because God is not doing anything for me. As we can stand and keep our focus and, and keep the truth of the word of God in front of us, God is is strengthening you, and you're going to find, oh, I made it through this day. I made it through this day. It didn't, the end did not come. It did not overwhelm me. It did not consume me. I am still here. And with that ability, and you know what? You may, you may stand in, pay, you may stand and wait for God 20 minutes today, and then you're all into it, you know. That is who we are. But you know what? God is not disappointed. He doesn't say, well, now look at that, you know. You would think by now this kid would finally be able to zip his own coat, you know. God doesn't look at us like that. He is so pleased. We stood the, we waited 15, 20 minutes. And you know what? Because that verse says, in this world, you will have tribulation. There's more than one. Have you figured that out yet? There's more than one. So, you know, if you mess up on this one, don't worry. There'll be another one. There'll be another one. And it gives us opportunity to stand in the reality of what Christ really did for us. In the truth of that, and to say, I, I am going to wait for God and I'm going to listen to God. Like I say, we're not running around humming a song. Doo, 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 doo. We, are, we are listening in the spirit. We are listening in the word. We are listening in godly counsel. You may, be, you may be talking to someone, and all of a sudden that person may say something to you, and you get this, mm, this quickening inside of you. That's God saying, listen up. I just gave you some information. I just gave you some direction. I just gave you some strength. And I use this one or this one to do it. So during this time, you keep your spiritual antennas all open and alert to God, don't we? So let's go back to Romans chapter 5, verse 3. I want to look at the New Living. I want to read it in New Living here for a minute. We're going to look at verse 3. So now that we understand patience has nothing to do with us, it's our willing spirit it's in our spirit we're learning to wait for god wait for god we can rejoice too oh we got more rejoicing to do happy 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 okay we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials for we know that they help us develop endurance endurance is so necessary and in scripture it speaks of this quite often our daughter, Julie, I'm just so proud of her. She was a young woman that had some health issues as a young woman, so she wasn't physically active. And one day she decided that she was going to do something different in her life. And she had one of these little bracelets that, or I don't know if it was a bracelet or a, some technical gizmo, which is beyond my scope of understanding. She had this little thing that would tell her, you're going to run for so many seconds or for a minute. You're going to walk for so many minutes or whatever. And she started doing that. And she said, 
at first she had all she could do is just get down the driveway to the mailbox and back. I mean, that's how bad physically she was. Her, her endurance was like nil. And, but she kept it up. She didn't quit. Next day it had to go a little bit further. So she went a little further and her body was screaming and hollering and complaining and she didn't quit. She didn't quit. I want to tell you what, my daughter now is running 25, 26 mile races. She runs up mountains. She was running up in the mountains of, in Virginia. She runs with the Marine Corps. I mean, this is some serious endurance that she has established. And what I want to say about that in regards to this, patience, when we learn to wait for God, in the waiting, we are that strength we talked about in Isaiah. You're going to renew your strength. Endurance is building up strength that you are in here for the long haul, and it, it comes in increments. You're not going to get up in the morning and run 50 miles because you decide, I'm going to be a runner today. You're going to run maybe to the end of the block, maybe to the end of the driveway. Maybe it'll be from your bed to the kitchen, you know? <laughs> you gotta start, you know, you start. You start in small increments. But if you keep at it, your endurance will get longer and longer and longer. And this tribulation that keeps coming, you're handling it better because you're learning to wait for God. And in the waiting, you feel empowered you feel stronger than ever before. That fear that used to just jump all over you, now it doesn't do that so often. You can get rid of it. You, have, you can see in by faith what God is doing, that expectancy, that hope is coming alive in you. And so you're going forward. You're going forward in this. And so endurance also, verse 4, develops... And endurance develops strength of character. Hmm. There again, so often we want to say, oh, it's all about us, you know, making me a better person, you know, a more spiritual person. And now that we've seen it's not anything about us, the beauty of this all is God uses a real bad situation that happens in life. He's using this to bring us to the place of developing Christ's character in us. Because as you wait for God and you gain strength, in that strengthening, you are developing, you are changing. You are changing from being a, a fleshly person that only responds and thinks out of their carnal mind, out of their mind, will, and emotions. Your body is reacting to life. That now, by waiting for God, and listening for his direction and his wisdom dealing with your life, you are getting stronger and stronger, and more of Christ now is coming because Christ, we are one. We are one. So now we're stepping out of being such a fleshly person into the spiritual person we really are, and that spiritual person that we really are is Christ. It's Christ. And so as people see our lives, and they're all watching and they're all listening because we all go through our stuff and we all talk about our stuff and it's very obvious. Anyone that knows us knows what it is. And now they see all of a sudden that you are responding differently. This thing that used, I mean, you used to be so fearful, you used to be so upset when things would go wrong in life, but golly, you're not doing that anymore. We are, they are beginning to see that we are this epistle read of all men that it is Christ. And what a testimony. They'll say, well, what has changed in you? What has changed that you are now a different person? You're handling this so differently. And it's Christ. Let me tell you what Christ has done. And as we stand in this place of confident victory, we know that it's all because of our relationship to the Father and in Christ. And so... Now we can understand with Paul when he says that in all scripture, in all, all tribulations, that there is joy. He can joy, he can rejoice. It doesn't matter what the tribulation is. It just doesn't matter. 
because he understands that in the midst of it all, God is with him. God is still. He is, his position in Christ is not altered just because of the circumstances of life. And learning that is a tremendous victory to say, it doesn't matter what's going on around me. That same God that, that blesses and, and renews my strength, that directs my life when everything is going right, is the same one that is still with me now when things are going so terribly wrong. God has not left us. He, has, he will never leave you nor forsake you. So in it all, Ephesians 4.13, let's look at that out of the New Living Translations. Oops. Okay, Ephesians 4 and 13. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son. Okay, so we're going to come to knowledge and faith of God's Son, aren't we? And when we, as that keeps progressing, we will, we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and the complete standard of Christ. That is where we're ultimately going to end up, as mature believers mature believers, ma complete in Christ. And so it won't make any difference to us what's going on in life because we understand who we are, who is in us, and what is being done. So as the tribulation, if you're in tribulation today, this is an excellent time to stop and wait for God. Wait for God. He's in you. He's talking to you. He'll make the way clear to you if you will wait. So Lord, bless you and have an awesome day today. This is a good day. Bring confident joy to those around you. A lot of people are in a lot of, a lot of hard places right now. They need to hear this word. They need to know that the Father is with them. And God has the answer even for them. And so grace and peace to you all, and we'll see you Wednesday.